This programme features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to a beautiful afternoon here in the Mara Triangle. It's fair enough. My name is Steve. Joined by... We hopefully have in store for you. Uh, James and I have been out for some hours already trying to find the Aweno Pride, um, but they have given us the slip. We thought we'd try the North Clan Den as well for the start of the show, but no one was home. So we have no idea where they are. Maybe they've just gone on a bit of a feeding frenzy, or who knows? We'll maybe check in on them a little bit later. So here yeah, we've framed up on a couple very grumpy looking buffaloes. And we thought maybe we'd go down to the Mara River quickly and just have a look and see what's going on and down there, if there's anything of interest. And the water level, no doubt, has dropped quite substantially. And uh, maybe there could potentially be some animals trying to cross. Now, I wonder if these two are going to have a little bit of an altercation. They've been staring at each other over about 60 meters. But I think they're just good friends. Hey? Two Duggar boys kicked out of a herd and that they will spend the rest of their days, no doubt, in each other's company. Don't forget, everybody, we are live interactive. We'd love to hear from you. Send through your questions and comments. Hashtag Fari Live. We'll throw them in on the YouTube chat stream. Let us know what you'd like to see this afternoon. Hopefully, we can accommodate. All right, everybody, we're going to go down to the Mara River and see what's happening over there. Okay, well, while we get around the corner here, get down to, I think, main crossing of the Mara River itself, we're going to send you down to Juma in the Sabi Sands with Lee, who's found some kudu. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Sunset Safari. My name is Lee Fuller, and we're in South Africa. We're in the Greater Kruger National Park complex, and... We're just in front of a little camp here at Juma Game Reserve and uh, we've hardly warmed up the engine of Rusty, the trusty Land Rover, and we've got some kudu in front of us here. Just going to head up onto the other side. They were looking a little alert, or more alert than normal we've been with them for about five or six minutes and they seem to have relaxed very nicely now nice big bull coming uh, up in front of us there look at those beautiful big spiraled horns Masters of camouflage are the kudu, as you can see, blending in to the surroundings pretty well. We're just going to edge up a little closer. Although I think they're going to be moving off out of view. Yeah, they've headed uh, headed up into the woodland there. So let's cross over to Jamie and see what she uh, has for us. A very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to the Sunset Safari. My name is Jamie and it's a, actually a miracle that you managed to see me there. And this afternoon, Sebastian is on camera with me and we are heading out into the wilds of Juma to see what we can find. And this morning I was on the back of the vehicle with Lee and I was very frustrated because I, we were driving around in the dark, it was so misty this morning for those of you that missed it. Uh, it was to the point that as we were, hmm? Nice yes, those of you that missed it. Mm. Thanks, Deb, I missed it. I said that she completely. It. <laughs> 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 this is going to be a great drive. It's only going to go downhill from here, folks. Um, so it was very misty, it was very difficult to see, and the light took a long time to 
sort of get to the point where we could see tracks. And as a result, I think if, if it hadn't been that way, we would have found Tingana because these tracks were very, very fresh coming this way. So I'm hoping, oh, this is not going to be our best work here, but we're going to look at a, the bottom of an Impala while it drinks, and I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm hoping we're going to catch up with him this afternoon if he hasn't decided to go wandering off Juma. Now, there's a good chance, actually, that he's somewhere down where this Impala is, actually, around this pan. This is Chele Pan. That's one of the... Oh, yes, clean your nostrils. There we go. Ladies like nice, clean nostrils. It's a defining thing for an Impala, especially at this time of year when breeding is on their minds. I think there's a good chance he's around here somewhere. This is the only water source in the area. I don't even know, actually, if Twin Dams has any water. Let's go and have a look. But I suspect there's a chance he is somewhere around here. So we're going to duck down into the Mulwati. We're going to check all of his favorite routes. Oh, my word. Hello, son. Let's keep driving. Otherwise, I will not be able to look at you. Proper winter sun. I'm going to be squinting. Um, I think there's a good chance he's hiding in, in the shade somewhere. We saw him yesterday, Jerry and I, on our way home after dinner. And for those of you that don't know, Jerry and I live along with Seb in a separate house away from the main camp. And Jerry's staying in Tristan and Ali's room. We were driving in last night and Jerry stopped in front of me right at the gate. And I thought to myself, Jerry, she switched off her lights. Come on, it's a scrub here. Can we, can we go? It's fine, it'll move, I promise. If your lights are off, it'll move. And Jerry sat there and sat there, and I thought, oh, I really just want to go to bed. Come on, Jerry. Then she, Jerry, started up and moved off, and I drove up behind her. <laughs> Tingana was right on the side of the road, and he jumped up and stared through my open window, and I went, ah! So we did see him, and I had a proper guiding fail last night. Yeah. Jerry, of course, 100% entitled to stop to look at the leopard right outside the gate. He then called all night when it felt like it was right outside my window because I live on that side of the house. So I could hear him sawing. He didn't move. He must have just been lying there going, oh, 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 for a good two hours. You know you're spoiled when you want the leopard to be quiet so you can go to bed. So his tracks, last tracks are here. Exactly, I'm not going to show them to you because you won't be able to see them with a light like this. And they go all the way into the Mulwati. Ah, yes. Murray says it is a tough life. It is a tough life indeed. It's tough for us here in South Africa. It's tough for the blokes in the Mara as well, especially when you're looking at the mammoths of the Mara River. Mammoths? Whatever. You know what I mean. Thanks, Jamie. It is always so special to be able to hear leopards calling at night. We had a whole lot of commotion behind our camp last night and found out this morning that the whole Olololo pride killed something behind our camp and then there was a huge boxing match between them and the Olololo clan. So we heard all sorts of noises last night, um, but uh, we did not go and investigate because, well, it was very late and very dark. So, anyway, we found out this morning there was indeed a Pride Alliance that made a kill, and then hyenas fought them for it. So that could have been my bucket list right there. But anyway, next time, here yeah, we are at the Mara River. You can see how much lower the water is than it was the other day. It's not really flowing down as strongly as it was, and the hippos are looking a lot happier, and the crocodiles even a little bit happier than they were, not being swept away downstream which is always something that happens when the river flows. Although on my way home the other night, there was about five or six crocodiles trying to cross the road uh, at one of the drainage lines where the water was flowing. It was quite incredible to see, um, but they did turn away as we approached the vehicle. But they don't like hanging out in these very fast flowing streams. You'll often find them and hippos moving to water that's a little more stable for a period of time. There we go. A couple of boys that aren't scared of the lurking crocodiles. A buffalo is not immune to being taken by a crocodile. 
<laughs> Mr. Tick, you want to know how many crocodiles live in this river? I could not give you a number. But last time I was here, James and myself had a few crossings and we counted 37 crocodiles on one kill in the river. And that was just at one little point. Uh, this river is 300 and something kilometers. Um, how much of it is within the Mara itself, I'm not 100% sure, but it goes all the way through the Mara down into Serengeti and then keeps going down to Lake Victoria. So I'm pretty sure that uh, there is more than 10. It's a lot of crocodiles. I couldn't tell you though, to be certain. Um, I don't know even how they would survey them. Maybe aerial survey would be easy enough to do. Hippos, I think, are easily done from the air, but crocodiles are a little bit more secretive, a little bit harder to catch from an aerial census. But uh, there are many, many crocodiles, and they are all waiting for the imminent migration and the crossing of the river. Well, that's what the wildebeest and the zebra will soon start undertaking. Hello, Rosalind. Well, the crocodiles are reptiles, so some people say they can go for up to a year without eating. Um, they don't need to. I mean, crocodiles here feed quite regularly, and then they gorge themselves in the migration. <clears throat> but there's records of crocodiles that were found up in Namibia in one of the rivers there. They were actually hibernating in caves underneath sort of these caves inside the river system somewhere, and they hadn't eaten in about a year. So that's what I've heard. Um, I haven't seen it for myself. I haven't asked a crocodile how hungry he is, but they are opportunistic and, well, they use the sun to keep themselves warm and the water to cool themselves down or just the wind. So they don't really need food for their metabolic processes like we do. So they can go for periods of time being very inactive. So apparently around about a year, which is a very long time. If you can imagine not eating for an entire year. James, you could manage that, could you? <laughs> James shakes his head very quickly. <laughs> Sometimes these long drives are too much. <laughs> anyway, we're going to move on from the river shortly, see what else we can find. Um, but wonderful to be down here, and it was so much higher the other day, if you recall. It was flooding down that side, and it was giving the hippos all sorts of distress. But anyway, let's carry on, shall we? No real big crocodiles today. I don't know where they are. Last time we were here, James, remember, just to this corner here, we saw the wildebeest or zebra get pulled apart. Oof, it was quite something. <laughs> okay, Murray. So, everybody, I'm going to be sending you back down to Juma with Jamie, who apparently has found some buck. <laughs> All right, so Steve, of course, eagerly anticipating the great migration, although it might take a little bit of time before the wildebeest get there. They've got quite a long way to go. We're sitting with an antelope that definitely, or oh, cute, doesn't migrate anywhere. So this is a tiny baby Nyala, not new new, probably around about two or so months old, maybe three. Look at the size of those ears. I mean, these antelope have large ears for their bodies at the best of times, but the babies are actually positively ridiculously oversized. Uh, what I've noticed about this herd of Inyala, and there's qu actually quite a few of them in the drainage line where I am. I'm in the Mulwati checking for Tingana. And what I've noticed is that these antelope are very nervous. Uh, they, they are by nature alert. Big ears like that, big eyes, immediately tells you that this is an antelope that's used to moving through dense areas and relying on its hearing in particular to help to keep it safe. But in fact, I think that they've seen a leopard in the last few hours. And the reason I say that is not just because Tingana's tracks were coming in this direction, but because there's also f tracks of a female leopard walking up along this drainage. So when we talk about drainage, we're talking about a river system which of course, because it's a river system, it's a water system, there's lots of underground water, therefore dense vegetation, therefore antelope like Nyala, therefore leopards, because there's some nice food around and lots of cover and lots of shade. 
Unfortunately, they're moving. We, there's quite a steep bank, so there's no way that we can really improve upon our view. We're going to try and cruise along down the Mulwati. Uh, Murray, just shout if you think that we're moving into shaky signal, which we might do shortly, but let's see how we go. How we go. Uh, I think they've seen something. They're very, very alert. Big, big ears, wide open, looking around them cautiously. They're definitely on edge. The tracks of the female leopard are going that way. I just want to check down here in case Tingana was around. We, of course, we never know exactly which uh, antelope is beautiful. We never know it is necessarily. Tlalam is getting to the point where her feet are the same size as her mom. But we work on the assumption to see the Tandi and, and or Tlalamba when we see female tracks in this particular spot. And when we see male tracks, we work on the assumption that it is Tijuana in this area. That doesn't always apply. Obviously, you get lots of different leopards moving through. So it is guesswork, but it is sort of educated guesswork. And I just want to check some of Tingana's favorite spots. Mm, not going to go down there yet. We will, though. We're going to do circles, then circles around this spot. I think Chelepan is a good place to be checking. I think as the evening draws in and the animals go to drink, you actually find that typically most people think at the hottest time of the day things are going to go and drink. That's true for elephants, but not necessarily for antelope. You'll find they'll stay in the shade, they'll feed, they'll ruminate until it gets a little bit cooler and then they go and they have a drink. And that's of course when you should start checking if you're looking for leopards. At least I've actually seen a leopard now. Before last night's surprise encounter with Tingana, I still hadn't seen a leopard since I got back and I was starting to get slightly depressed. Two days without a leopard on Juma. Unacceptable. And we're driving now on a road that's quite new and it was created largely thanks to Hosanna and Shongile. Because Karula spent a lot of time with them around here and obviously whenever we found them we used to use this route in to get to them and eventually it got to the point where it was decided to make it an official road. So we owe this road to Hosanna. It should have been called Hosanna's road but it's not. It's called Mamba Loop. Much less exciting. However, please don't petition anyone to name it Hosanna's road definitely not go down now. Ah, Murray, would that I could, would that I could. But I fear were I to change it to Hosanna's Road, it would be an outcry. So no, I'm afraid not. It shall remain Mamba Loop. For it loops around Mamba Road. It does make sense. Pretty logical. Hello, little lone male impala. I'm not going to stop for you right now. I'm looking for leopards. Oh, there's another lone male impala. So at this time of year, that's pretty common to see because the males are rutting, which is a terrible time for the young males because what happens to them is they've got all of the hormones but none of the strength. And they're not ready to compete for... They are not yet ready to compete for mating rights. No, it's just very odd looking herbivore dung. They're not yet ready to compete for mating rights. And so they have all of, you know, their instinct is driving them towards the females, but they're still about roughly two thirds of the size of a four year old big adult male impala. So there's actually no chance at all, unless they get really, really lucky which I've seen happen not with an impala, but with Nyala. I saw three big males fighting over a female, and it's not often you see Nyala physically come to blows. And they were fighting really fiercely, to the point that one was actually quite badly injured. And while they were doing that, this young male, who hadn't even fully got rid of his stripes yet, <laughs> snuck off around the corner with a female. It was hilarious. None of the other adult males realized. He looked so pleased with himself as well. So that's, there's perhaps a, a small, minuscule chance 
that the young, little young male impala might have a chance, but it's very seldom. Mm. Just goes to show it's not always about brawn. Sometimes a little bit of brain helps. Speaking from a female perspective, it often helps. A little bit of brain would be ideal. In fact, a little bit of brain is really appreciated. <sighs> Little leopards, where are you hiding? Tingana, I'm really sorry I didn't see you last night, but I would really like to see you again this afternoon, if you would be so kind. At least there's something to look forward to. And that's it's going to become easier and easier to see into the bush. Yes, true. I'm sure we'd all like to see Hosanna as well, but I'm afraid so far that hasn't seemed likely. And Tristan's on leave. Imagine if we saw Hosanna without Tristan while he was on leave. I think he would be devastated. We also, of course, have to find Tundi's den, but to be honest, we'll, we'll get there. You know, when she's ready, we'll figure out where it is. She'll let us figure out where it is, and she'll lead us to it. I'm not too stressed about that. It will come with time. We just want to make sure that we don't pressurize that area or walk into that area, because nobody wants to encounter a, an upset Tundi on foot. Although I'd take it right now. Now Spass wants to know if it's possible to see any babies around, which actually ties in quite nicely with what I was saying. Certain animals don't have a set breeding season, like leopards for example, so we strongly suspect that one of the female leopards, Tundi, has given birth in the last few days. That obviously means the babies are very, very small and as a result have to be treated very, very carefully uh, by us and so does Tundi. We have to give her a great deal of space in situations where we think she might have hidden the cubs. Sorry, my booster seat's fallen out of place. I'm about to fall out of the car. And so there are possibilities for vultures are breeding at the moment, which means we could see baby vultures. Wild dogs are about to actually come into their breeding season, which if we were phenomenally fortunate, there is always the possibility that they could den on Juma. And that hasn't happened in many, many years. But imagine seeing little tiny wild dog puppies, little ones like this. I think people would be ecstatic. Can't even imagine it. Last time I saw wild dog puppies was with Jerry, years ago. So there's possibility of wild dog puppies. Baby antelope? No, not really. It's unlikely that we'll see any brand new babies now. Typically, although not all of them breed at exactly the same time, they obviously try to time their babies during the rainy season when there's plenty of food for both the mothers and for the little ones. The little ones need to be weaned quite quickly. They grow very quickly. They obviously need plenty of sustenance and the females need to eat as much as possible to produce milk and then to recover physically because a lot of them breed every single year so they need that recovery period. So you'll find that most of them don't give birth around this time. What other babies could we see? Mm, baby people? There's been a baby boom in our camp. Lots of people having babies. Amanda's gone off to have her babies, or baby. Amanda is our chef, for those of you that don't know. Um, what other babies are around? The, most of the birds are now finished with their breeding season. So it's unlikely we'll see baby birds, except for vultures. I've now run out of babies to talk about. Of course, talking about little baby animals, that is completely different in the Maasai Mara. The seasons are entirely different, as Steve knows, because I believe he saw a baby buffalo yesterday. 
Well, indeed, yesterday, you all probably saw me with that herd of buffalo, and we watched them cross the road, and we counted probably about six or seven brand spanking new little buffalo calves. Uh, we did stay with that uh, herd for some time to see if maybe the hyenas would come back. They didn't. See if lions would come, they didn't. And then we bumped into someone who thought we had lions. We didn't. And they told us about a cheetah. So we went over to the area where we've been seeing these cheetah. And well, we found a male cheetah who I haven't yet identified because he was in the long grass. And we just missed him making a kill, a Thompson's gazelle, by a couple of minutes, I think. But uh, he was in the long grass, and it wasn't the best of visuals. But it definitely wasn't Moogie, I can guarantee you that. I did take some photos, um, but I still need to compare them. But it was sort of a, a shielded face mask with uh, grass. So anyway, we're going to see if Manu is the, the lucky charm, or if James has got it as well, because we're going to head back into that area now, see if maybe we can find a cheetah being busy this afternoon. We have done an entire enormous loop over there. We've been searching. There's lots of elephants around, fair amount of buffalo, uh, but the predators seem to be hiding from us today. We even checked the other two den sites now of the North Clan, and there's nobody home. I don't know what's going on. Is it a hyena holiday? Maybe a hyena seminar somewhere off somewhere? I'm not sure. <laughs> I really don't know. Okay. There's a big crossroads in the road here. We're gonna take a big left and we're gonna head and see if maybe we can have some more luck. Four days in a row for Cheetah. That would be something, wouldn't it? That would be my record, I think. I think three yesterday was my record. And then before that was two, so that's just my record. Two in a row, three in a row. Hello, Natalina. Well, there's lots of young hyenas at the moment. Um, at the North Clan Den. I don't know who they are though. Uh, polar Bears got one, Inca's got two, or it's the other way around. I think Polar Bears got two and Inks got one at that den site. Um, and then obviously Waffles is at one of the dens. We didn't find her as well today. And her two youngsters are growing very, very quickly. Uh, Elovo and Grenadine, they are looking very, very good. Uh, although I've only seen them lying down uh, suckling, but they've, they've grown substantially from when I was here in November. But they're kind of matching the same sort of size as the, the Juma clan members because uh, they kind of were born at the same sort of time, which is a little bit earlier, I think, actually. They were a few months earlier. But it's hard to, to really compare the size because they're so much fluffier here than they are. Have we got a car, do we? We're good? We always move out of the way if there's anyone behind us, but it's a very quiet time of year in the Mara. We hardly see any vehicles at the moment, which is quite lovely. Quite lovely. Sometimes we spend entire three hours with a cheetah with no one there. And then when they do come, we get a bit annoyed. Like, how can you come and share this with us now? <laughs> we're just a little bit jealous, aren't we? A little bit possessive. <laughs> anyway, we're gonna see if we can find you a cheetah. Will four days in a row work? Everybody on board? James, you're on board. James has got no choice here, really. I'm driving. <laughs> I'm only joking. James likes cheetah. He does indeed. Uh, we might also be lucky in this area to find the Salt Lake Pride. We had really nice sighting with them on Sunday. Um, and it's the same sort of area. Uh, just up ahead here as well is where... Oh, there's it looks like a hyena. No, that's the Thompson's Gazelle. My bad. Both James and I have already seen two hyenas today that were actually topi from the distance. They've got the same sort of angle. Here we go. It has a beautiful... Are oh, you a Grant's Gazelle? You look like you might be a Grant's Gazelle lying over here. Those beautiful horns. He's a magnificent specimen. Just sitting down. We know we saw Moogie the other day have a look at a group of these guys and he decided, no thanks, I'm not going to catch you, you're way too big for me. So you'll notice that he doesn't have the black on the side, which the Thompson's gazelles have got. If you do confuse them, they are also enormously, well, not enormously, but much bigger than that of the Thompson's gazelle. 
We mm -hmm. saw that noticeably the other day when they were standing together with the Tommies and uh, Moogie, the male cheetah, was looking at them and going, oh, you're too big, I want a Thompson's gazelle, which have all run away. Just to show you the size, there's a Thompson's gazelle just off. Oh, there he's standing up. Look at that. There's a Tommy just off in the distance. You'll see the size difference now. And that's a big male. And there's long horns. And you see the black stripe on the side. Very good. I haven't seen the, the Grant's gazelles running, but to the Thompson's gazelles are very, very quick. Very white bottom, doesn't he? Looks like he's going to go say hello to a lady there. There's a female. Bearing in mind, everybody, gazelles, male and female, have both got horns. Oh, he's going to go and investigate. Gazelles are open plains specialists, and so the horns are therefore some form of defense, especially of the calves, when the calves or lambs, should I say, when they're born against any open plain predators. They don't seem to turn the horns on a cheetah, though, the Thompson's gazelles. But the Grant's gazelles were looking at Mugi the other day, and he decided, um, no thanks, you're a little bit too big. You can see the size comparison, can't you? They're so much bigger. If you if you see them on their own, you can can confuse it at a first glance. But if you just give a few moments, remember everybody, we are live, and we'd love to get any comments or feedback, questions. Hashtag Safari Live. Well, I'm going to, oh, he looks like he's definitely very interested in her. Ian, I, I don't 100% know the history, um, but normally when you find the name Thompson or, oh, hang on, he's going to taste the urine. Sorry, everybody, we've got to stop there. Thompson is probably a, a gentleman who founded the Thompson's Gazelle, and Grant is probably a gentleman who founded or named the Grant's Gazelle, and both of those names are in their scientific name. Grant T. I. and Thompson I, I think, if I've got that correct. So generally, like Le Vallant was also a naturalist, he named a lot of birds. So like uh, Birchall as well was a naturalist, he named zebras, there's birds, there's lots and lots of names that aren't really related to specifically that animal, but the guy found it himself. And so they've labeled them according to whoever it was that first um, brought back a specimen or took photos, or probably in those days it was drawings and diagrams. It might have even been live or um, entire carcasses, which were then taken back to the UK or to wherever they sound like Thompson and Grant, definitely probably UK um, naturalists, and they would have taken them back to, to the London, of course, and everything would have been classified. And a lot of these things probably happened more than 100, maybe even 150 years ago, back in the, maybe even less. A lot of sort of this part of the world was discovered quite, quite early on. He's definitely interested in her, isn't he? Now, this is the perfect terrain and landscape for these gazelle. And it's why we look out here for the tutor. Spats, well, uh, he definitely looks like he's interested. She doesn't really look like she's interested, but he's doing all of the body posturing to say... To, to show that he's interested. Um, he's even tasted the urine. And um, there's probably all sorts of pheromones coming off of her that uh, basically letting him know that she is indeed in estrus, or maybe not at all. But he wouldn't be getting all interested like that, excuse me, if he wasn't, if she wasn't giving off any chemicals. Follow her around until <laughs> she accepts him. Going to Okay, so Grant's Gazelle, indeed. I'll find the scientific name for you, just so that we've got it properly. Gazelle Granti, Granti. So definitely named after someone by the name of Grant, probably a surname. 
They don't often get first names in these sort of scientific names. And then Thompson's gazelle, indeed gazelle Thompsonii. So generally the person who founded the animal. Very good. Well, we're going to carry on down the road. Yeah, she's running away. She's not interested in him at all. She's giving him the slip. <laughs> Let's keep going and see if out in this open area we can find ourselves one of those fast cats. What do you reckon? James, you're feeling lucky. Yes. Yes? James is feeling lucky. I'm feeling lucky. Three days in a row. That's serious luck. We're not going to jinx it today. No jinxing it. Okay, very good. Well, we're going to continue on here, see what we can find, keep scanning the open areas, and while we do that, send you back on down to Lee and Juma, who's found a lizard. That's very faint. Where's the other one? It was lying up there. Uh, Problem has happened down there, everybody. I do apologize, but you are back with us, and we're about to see a topi standoff. Here we go. Let me just position ourselves. There we go. It's not often you actually get to see the topis fighting, and when we just see these two, they postured up, and I think they are ready to box. Let's have a look, everybody, shall we? Two territorial males, no doubt having a dispute. It's always about ladies, you see. Problem is I can't see a single lady in in the vicinity. So a very similar sort of fighting style to the, the, the wildebeest when they go down on their knees like that and their head goes very low down to the ground and then they can hit heads against each other. I've only seen it once before. I saw some young males the other day sort of playing around. And when I was here last year, early on in the year, I had two males having a little bit of a, a little bit of a go. And the grass was a lot shorter, so it made it a little bit easier to see. But aren't they both just beautiful? Now, to get to the stage, both of these animals would have ascertained that they're bigger or, or happy with the size of the other animal. Topi, like wildebeest, like to give off visual displays to show how big they are. Quite often, they'll actually cover their horns in mud, self-adornment, kind of, to make them look bigger, thicker, and more formidable. And uh, then, ideally, no one will challenge them if they look too big. But if they are then challenged, then this is kind of what starts happening. They start sort of squaring off to each other and sort of bowing down on their knees as they try and headbutt. Hopefully we're going to get them having a little bit of a go. They're doing a lot of similar stuff to what the Impala do these days. You see the Impala males, you just want to see them have a fight and then they keep looking off at potentially some animal that is coming in to catch them. And I think sometimes they do that to sort of lower the guard of their opponent. And not looking very vicious today. <laughs> a lot of fainting. I want to see a proper parry here. See the guy on the left is down in the proper posture. 
You see how they arc their back like that gives them a lot of power. It's very difficult to push them backwards when they're at that angle. And I think this is all for show. Are you getting any comms there, James? Sorry, I'm not hearing anything. I think we've lost Murray. Beautiful silhouettes of these two guys. Okay, well, they seem to start having a little bit of a nibble there. There we go. Come on, guys, show us how it's done. If we're a little bit closer, we'd probably be able to hear when they do hit heads. But there's not too much in it at the moment. You can see how equal in size they are, both fully grown males fighting over their patch. Of course, small little territories that they acquire, and then the females will come into those areas to feed. And, well, maybe these guys don't have the best territory because there's not a single other topi anywhere nearby. Okay, well, we're going to move on from this boxing match. I don't think it's going to go any further than a few handbags. And while we do that, let's go back on down to Juma with Jamie Patterson. It's another antelope that has a truly extraordinary structure when it comes to their social interactions. And of course, at the moment, what, where are we? What time of year is it? They've actually just finished lekking. So those two males are probably a bit behind the times. Lekking is something that's unique to certain types of antelope and certain types of birds as well. What they do is they basically form these huge groups and each male will fight for a termite mound. It's quite ridiculous. The females get involved as well. Sometimes when they see a male courting a female and they think that they would like to mate with that male, they'll go and bodily knock the other female out of the way so that they can mate the male. And they are not passive in their approach to picking the best mate. We've now arrived at Twin Dams and there is another antelope here, an antelope that definitely doesn't do any sort of necking, um, lecking. Thinking of giraffe fighting now. And uh, where is he? He ran away. Oh, really? That's thoroughly depressing. Which way did he run? Uh, north. Oh, gone. Gone forever. How awful. All right, let me try and see if I can find him again. It was a water buck. It was a big male water buck. But now he's gone. How sad. Let's see if we can find him again. Whew. Note to self, this time of day is not a good time to be looking over Twin Dams with the sun at this level. He's gone completely. He's gone forever. It's all the way over there. What a pity. Okay, well, we'll see what else we can find at Twin Dams. I'm convinced that Tingana's here somewhere. I'm absolutely certain. He's just hiding under a bush deep in the shade. It's quite warm this afternoon for this time of year. It was yesterday as well. I, still, I think he'll be tucked away in the shade. He might come out for a little bit of sun a bit later. Ah, oh, disappointing. I'd hoped there might be something exciting to show you at Twin Dams. Remember, you can send through your questions and you can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Which is exactly what Kusiak, Kusiak, not sure if I'm getting that right. Sinak is wondering um, whether I have any updates on Hosanna. I don't. I don't have any new updates. I think that just before I came back, I heard a rumor that he was seen, I think it was from Tristan actually, so it's not really a rumor, but it's more of an update, that he was seen on the border of Londolozi quite close to the Arethusa boundary, which is good news because that m puts him a little bit closer to here. But to be honest, I think that Hosanna is going to try and set, look, we can't predict anything. I think he's probably going to try and settle himself down somewhere else. 
possibly around that Londolozi area. And the reason I think that is because I think he got quite intimidated by the skittish male that has been wandering around here. I just want to check. I saw a bird land in the tree across that side. I just want to check and see if it's a bird of prey. It's typically things like batteliers, tawny eagles. Waterbuck, if I go to you, are you going to stay? Yeah. We'll often look for leopard kills in those big trees and try and sneak some food off them. But I'll go down there when I have, when I'm off air, because I don't want to lose signal down there. So I'll try to show you this waterbuck who's being thoroughly unobliging. Is he gone again? <laughs> Is this, does this waterbuck actually exist? Am I just hallucinating? Ah, and Denise wants to know why some are called antelope, why some are called gazelles, and why this one is called a waterbuck. This one, this particular antelope is called a waterbuck because it is gone. <laughs> That's not why it's called a waterbuck though. I can't go that way, there won't be signal down there. The reason that it's called a waterbuck is because they actually do spend quite a lot of time around water and often retreat to water when threatened around into the rivers or, or something like, you know. Well, it, it's particularly in Botswana and areas like that where they can run into the, the swampy areas. So that's why it's called a waterbuck, but it belongs to the cob group, the genus Cobus. So there's the Cobus, uh, there's the Lechwe, there's the... I can't think now. Anyway, it belongs to a specific group of antelope. So do gazelles. So a gazelle is a type of family or genus of antelope. So all gazelles are antelope, but not all antelope are gazelles. Does that make sense? So you get the spiral horned antelope family, the things like your kudu, Nyala, Elant, Bushbuck, Sitatunga, all of those, Bongo, all of those sorts of antelope, ouch, something just stung me, belong to one family, one genus, and then there's another type of genus known as the gazelles, or another type of family, it's a tribe, it's not quite a whole genus. And they are things like your Thompsons, your Grants, and so on. So there's, they are grouped into loose families based on certain traits, things like their horn structure, things like uh, their gland positioning, their diet, their habitat, all of those sorts of things. And then a lot of them can interbreed. So a sesame, for example, is actually a, it's basically a topi. But it's the, we get sesame here in southern Africa and topi up across in the more northern part of Africa. And they could interbreed. And often you'll find that, uh, not often, occasionally where there's no other opportunity to breed, Tessabee and Hartebeest will breed as well together. And there's recorded cases of Waterbuck and Lechwe interbreeding as well. So those, you, you do find that sometimes the ones grouped together in the families can interbreed, usually when there's no other option presented to them. What stung me? Not serious, it's not excruciating, it's just irritating. Okay, well we've done one full circle around Treehouse da Twin Dams. No sign of Tingana, let's just go around and down to the Mulwati. He sometimes hides down here. I'm going to be very upset if I find out from one of the other guides that he has moved off the property. Lots of searching going on this afternoon on Juma. I'm searching high and low. Apparently, so is Lee. Let's go and find out what he's actually searching for. So Craig and I have come quite far east this afternoon. We've had the sun in our backs and we're a, a little further afield in a, uh, a territory a young female leopard, Kichava. This is her. 
home range and uh, so far we haven't uh, found any tracks or any sign of her but it's absolutely perfect leopard territory this the uh, leaves of a lot of these trees these deciduous trees are turning this time of year fall as it's known in uh, the northern hemisphere autumn down here and uh, it really is a, a beautiful patchwork quilt the, the view especially from the air or when we get up to high ground and you look down below is really beautiful the the colors uh, the autumn colors of browns and oranges and reds some of them yellow golden and then you do have some evergreen trees in the middle of them and especially down along the drainage lines and the streams and riverbeds so it really is a beautiful mosaic pattern this time of year the bush is turning the grass of course is also going brown and uh, these trees are not dying the grass isn't dying the plant itself stays alive but what it is is a state of dormancy the grass uh, is a perennial every year the uh, top part of the grass dies back and dries off the roots remain intact and while we usually don't get much rain down this part of the world over the winter months that's a good state of being to be in if you're a plant dormant it would be the mammal or animal equivalent of slowing down your metabolism and then these trees as well the same principle all their leaves are lost and uh, and they will be able to survive through the dry season well things that like to hang out in these trees are monkeys and i believe jamie's got some for us all right so i actually said to seb on our way down towards twin dams i would kill for a monkey sighting and would you believe it i haven't actually had to kill anyone We've actually managed to find some monkeys sitting up in a jackalberry tree. You've been talking about the, the loss of leaves, of course. This for the monkeys also means that food at times will become challenging, but for now that that will ensure that they well, that will mean that they spend most of their time before we get to that point supplementing their diet as much as possible. So that means eating the jackalberry fruit. Look at his little teeth. Is that nice? That is so cool. Get the best out of it. Those fruits are very, very hard. And they're not actually that appetizing, to be honest. Hmm. Yum. Uh, you've got a little something there on your... on your cheek. Never mind. I suppose it doesn't really matter too much if you're a monkey. Just watch the way that they use their fingers to grip onto the fruit such a human those of you with toddlers who've watched your toddlers feed oh what what happened there the monkey's got a serious fright oh no man there's a leopard here somewhere yes yes or is he just rutting no he's rutting no oh, he's rutting the way he moved there <laughs> and Paula gave a monkey a fright. <laughs> it's just it's that time of year where <laughs> one one never knows if the impala are giving alarm calling or they're starting the rut. Anyway, moving back on to our monkey. Those of you with toddlers, I'm sure you've seen them eat this way, despite your best efforts. In fact, I have been known to devour my post leave cupcakes in this way as well sorry not my post leave my post work cycle cupcakes I always treat myself to a cupcake after i go when i go on leave and then peeling the skin back getting to the fleshy part of the fruit the skin obviously not particularly appetizing hmm that wasn't very nice but was it <laughs> he looks exactly like my friend's baby when pre presented with solids Rosalind wants to know how long a monkey will live. Rosalind, they actually quite, they can actually live for, for quite a long period of time. So over 10 years is not uncommon for vervet monkeys. And I think actually in, in captivity they can probably live even longer than that, possibly up to 20. I'm not 100% sure on that. 
but I think that there's a good chance that's the case. Sorry guys. Truck. Hope you got some lovely ambient there. <laughs> We're on the main road, the main access road. So any any sort of building work that's being done or maintenance on the lodges, this is where the construction vehicles move through. So that's what that sound was. Right, where was I? Can't even remember. Talking about lifespans of monkeys. Their biggest threats, um, things like birds of prey. Actually, something like a martial eagle would be potentially a threat to a vervet monkey as would leopards actually as well and in fact sometimes you find that some leopards specialize in catching monkeys afternoon tax i'm just working around batalia twin dams all the mamba road that side looking for tingana Ellie wants to know where monkeys go to give birth. Ellie, they can give birth in trees, but they can also give birth on the ground. Uh, human beings are one of the mammal species that struggle the most when it comes to labor. Most of the other mammal species can give birth quite, I mean, obviously, to, <laughs> they all suffer to some degree, but it is, generally speaking, quite a, quite a lot easier. And what they'll do is they'll often move a little bit away from the troop because especially for low ranked females so the oh, sorry guys hold on one moment yeah AFM um, last tracks were going down to the Mulwati around Batalia Junction There's also tracks for a female leopard going north up the Mulwati from Mumba Road side towards Spaghetti Junction. What was I saying? Talking about? Monkeys. Oh, social structure. So monkeys have quite... <laughs> Just tracks, tacks. Just tracks. Uh, tracks for male leopard going from... Um, just south of Chelepan towards Mulwati around Spaghetti Junction and tracks for a female leopard going north from the Mulwati from Mumba Road Junction towards Batalia. If one more person asks me I'm unplugging my radio. Copy thanks Tax. I'm also working around here see what we can find. Okay what was I talking about again? Right we were talking about the social structure of monkeys. The females have quite a strict dominance hierarchy and it works in a way sort of similar to hyenas in that it's inherited. So the little ones inherit the status of their mothers and you get low ranking females and high ranking females and sometimes the high ranking females can actually be quite quite horrible to the low ranking females and they, ha they are occasionally known to kidnap little babies. And then basically what that means is they just walk up to the low-ranked female and they just grab the babies and the, the females get very, very upset. It happens in baboons as well. And then the males step in. So you'll probably find that low-ranked females will move away a little bit to give birth. I'm looking to see now if I can see a baby monkey. We were talking about babies earlier and I have seen a few tiny babies. There's one that we can see a little bit better, Seb, I think. No, never mind, it's moved now. It was on the other side of the tree. There's one on that branch, sort of more, a bit more exposed. Where is it now? Uh, if you go up, you see her there. Oh, you got him. Wait, which one are you, which branch is that? Oh, there, you're looking there. I'm looking at the one above that. There's one slightly above that. It might be easier for you. Am I going crazy? Where is it? This tree is, this tree is really confusing. In my, in my screen, yeah, it, all looks the same. it all looks the same. Yeah. Um, can we, so this uh, is that one. That's that, is that that, that, that bottom branch? Yes. Yeah, I think I'm too low. Oh, I think you're too... There, there, there. Go up a little bit more. There. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. I couldn't work out where you were either. Thanks, Seb. Yeah. Marvellous. I, well, 
Going through the training process, I tried to use the camera for training drive purposes, and I have to tell you that I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I take my hat off to our cameraman. I would, but my microphone's in it. But they're quite amazing with what they can find. It is very difficult to find something through the eye of the camera. Kenneth wants to know what the difference is between a monkey and an ape. Quite a big difference in the sense that there's a big difference between a house cat and a lion. Now, they're all types in that case of feline, but in the case of monkeys and apes, they're all types of primates, but they're very, very different and they're completely separate branches of the the group of primates so I mean apes tend to be much larger obviously they also have different social structures they're they're a bit smarter as a general rule uh, in in terms of our human understanding of intelligence their problem solving is better we don't we actually don't have any apes here in South Africa we have different types of primates we get vervet monkeys we get baboons we get bush babies but we don't have any types of apes here. So you, you're looking at a, a completely different type of primate in the same way that, you know, we're completely different to monkeys. Oh, is that nice? I wonder how they pick them, because they all look the same to me, but there's obviously some that seem riper than others. Look how beautiful that fur is. Shiny, like a shampoo advert. I can't say the name of a shampoo brand, otherwise I'll be in trouble for copyright, but or advertising or something. This is lovely. I think I might sit here for a while and let the monkeys find my leopard. Lee has been much more proactive about his approach, and he's found some feathered creatures. So while the monkeys are helping Jamie find a leopard there, we uh, have found a Birchall's starling, and uh, they are very common birds out here. We see them oh, five or six times an hour, but they are beautiful. That uh, bright blue iridescence, the entire starling family are a magnificently colorful family. The iridescence in their feathers glinting in the sun, if you see them in the shade or against the sun, in other words, backlit, they appear black. And that is a reflection rather than an actual pigment in the feather, interestingly enough. The starlings uh, out this part of the world become quite habituated and very used to human presence and uh, quite often in camps and lodges, picnic sites in the game reserves uh, down in Southern and East Africa, the starlings become quite entertaining and will join you without being invited for afternoon tea. Speaking of afternoon tea, I did have uh, a bag of peanuts and raisins stolen by some monkeys just before drive. I uh, knew they were in the tree above us in our little camp and um, put the peanuts and raisins down and it didn't take uh, longer than about four seconds with my back turned for the monkey to shoot down the tree, grab my peanuts and raisins and head for the hills. So it does sound like quite an endearing story, but uh, yeah, the primates especially and baboons are not that uh, welcome anywhere near camp. Uh, quite often they become very over habituated and that's not ideal when you start adjusting their habits, their feeding habits. Anyway, things uh, from a terrain point of view or from a vegetation point of view, if you have a look around, have changed somewhat. Um, not a brown or yellow or red leaf in sight. And we're driving along the edge of a little drainage line. To my right here is a little stream. It's a, it's a dry stream bred now. But um, we below an area where water will infiltrate from the higher ground to my left and come seeping through called a seep line and a lot of these quarry trees and terminalia trees uh, remain green along this little edge little green belt um, 
these green belts, you know, you see them very clearly this time of year from the air. Usually uh, when all the other deciduous trees around us are green, you don't really notice much difference. But this time of year, especially from the air, these little green belts stick out like a sore thumb. And it's these green belts that uh, the leopards do prefer. They do offer a bit more cover this time of year. So when all the other bushes and the deciduous trees lose their leaves, the uh, remaining green, like this bush to the right here, stay nice and green and full of foliage and uh, offer an ideal opportunity for a leopard to use the cover. To our left here is um, continuing our spider theme from this morning. A different kind of uh, spider. It's backlit now by that setting sun. And that's about the size of a baseball, the central part of that web, and it's called a community nest spider. Very appropriately named because uh, it is a community of spiders that live inside there. And sometimes, if you look very carefully, you can uh, see, oh, tens, you know, maybe up to a hundred little spiders that live in there. We don't like to disturb animals here at Safari Live, um, but I have, on one or two occasions when I was a much younger guide, stuck a stick in there and you uh, get everybody all excited and what the stick does, the tip of the stick would, would, would simulate a, an insect being caught in that web, the outer web, and uh, out would rush all these spiders and we'd ooh and ah. But uh, yeah, we don't like to disturb animals too much and um, that might not sound like it's disturbing animals, but yeah, you, as a spider, don't want to get your heart rate up or get too excited. It's all about energy expenditure. Spiders, interestingly enough, have an incredible ability to slow their metabolism down, and they can go for months without, um, without eating. Quite fun this morning's spider theme got me into the books before afternoon drive and uh, reading up about arachnids. And James alluded to spiders perhaps, you know, living longer than a year and, and the little tropical tent web spiders, you know, growing their web. Uh, spiders grow through a process called ecdysis, which is like shedding their skin. And yeah, the books allude to some species of spiders living up to 25 years, which I find absolutely incredible. We couldn't find out exactly which species they were. And I imagine these smaller species, so a little community nest spider, each one's about half the size of my little fingernail. But a big spider, a baboon spider, a thing that would fill the palm of my hand quite easily, yeah, perhaps uh, 25 years, which is incredible longevity for such a small animal. Community nest spider. We're gonna keep going. And uh, see uh, see what else we can find. My apologies to the arachnophobic viewers. I know I've spoken probably more about spiders today than I have in a long time, but they are pretty fascinating. And actually, here in Africa, there's only five species of what they call a species of medicinal importance or a venomous spider. And uh, they aren't the ones that you would think would be the venomous ones. They're not the big and hairy, scary ones. They're often small little things. Um, what's called elsewhere in the world a black widow spider. We call them black button spiders. They're very inconspicuous uh, abdomen, a jet black abdomen, but they're not much bigger than, once again, my little fingernail. So Jamie's still with her monkeys, so let's go and have a look what those little primates are up to. Well, I have to tell you, talking about fears of spiders, when I was little I was actually quite scared of monkeys as well. 
I was savagely attacked once when I was little in a resort where they'd been um, fed and they'd come to associate human beings with food, which is why, of course, we don't feed wild animals. I wasn't actually savagely attacked. They just opened up my hand and took my piece of fruit. But at the time, it felt like a savage attack. I was very little and I was very, very frightened. So after that, I was afraid of monkeys for a little bit. So there you go. I am no longer afraid of monkeys. I am occasionally offended by monkeys because they're one of the few animals out here that recognize the difference between men and women and respond differently to them. So I can spend my whole time shouting at a monkey trying to get it to go away if it's trying to steal food and it'll just look at me, give me the side eye and then a man comes out and then they scatter. It's very offensive in this day and age. I thought we'd sit here for a little bit because things are quiet and I was really hoping for a monkey sighting. It's actually been quite peaceful watching these chaps as they move about to this jackalberry looking for different fruits. Now don't hide behind there. I'm actually just thinking about how wonderful it would be to have such a prehensile tail. Another difference, of course, between monkeys and apes. Typically apes don't have tails like that. And imagine how wonderful, I know we've spoken about this before, I've often brought it up on live drives, how much I would love to have a tail. I know it would be weird, but I mean, I don't want to be alone in having a tail. I'd like it to be a human trait. Oh, I don't want to be the only human with a tail. That might be a bit embarrassing. Although, imagine the Instagram followers you'd get. It's the only human with a, you could be, oh my word. You could make so much money off that being the only human with a, with a tail. I'd be out of here. I'd be, I'd be jet setting around the world with, your tail. with my tail. <laughs> But do you know those moments when you're carrying a cup of tea and a book or something and you can't open a door? Shoot your tail. Cross with someone and you don't want to be offensive? Show them with your tail. It would be wonderful. Although people would always step on other people's tails. Although you didn't have to have a long one that dragged on the ground. Murray says she's sure that there are lots of people that would love to have tails. Uh, we've definitely spoken about this before. Um, I'm willing to put it again out to those of you watching. Would, would you like to have a tail or not? In this scenario, it is a pretty prehensile tail. So it is able to, to move around. It's not just a, an out of control tail. You've got a little bit of control over it. Would you like to have a tail? Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Please feel free to send through your answers. If you could have one animal trait, what would it be? I think, I think a tail would be quite cool. So would the strength of a leopard, or the agility of a leopard. Spaz wants to know if monkeys will ever store food for dry periods. Do you know, I'm actually not 100% sure about that. I don't think so, and I have never observed it personally. I've never seen them go back to a food storage, but they are incredibly intelligent. They really are, and they're often studied as a sort of a model for understanding human social communication and, and human social structure. Not that we have a necessarily the same but it's just a way of understanding our background so I wouldn't put it past them they've also been shown to be spiteful which we think of as a, a very human trait they've been known to destroy food just to make sure that one of their um, troop members doesn't get it that they don't like so they you know they've, they've they have a lot of human traits so it's possible that they plan you know, there's been examples of monkeys that have never been recorded, different species of monkeys, not vervet monkeys, but different species of monkeys actually learning to use tools and using rocks, where, of course, we all know, I mean, it's, it's quite a commonly known story of chimpanzees using sticks to break open hives or termite mounds and uncovering things in trees. But it's recently that monkey, some a species of monkey, and for the life of me, I cannot remember what it is, which means I probably shouldn't have brought it up. And there's a species of monkey that did actually learn to use rocks. So sort of entering their version of the Stone Age. 
Capuchin monkey. Mm -hmm, that them? That's them. That's exactly it. Well done, Seb. Thank you. Would you like to take over? <laughs> I'll try. I'll try film. Kripal says that he'd rather have wings over a tail. Okay, fair enough. Yes, I probably... Yes, yeah, you're right. Okay, fair enough. I should have said a yes or no question, really. And then one person has said absolutely, definitely not. No tail for them. I don't know. I think it would be quite handy. Although, maybe it would get in the way when you're sleeping. When you try and roll over. When you wake up with a dead dead tail instead of a dead arm with pins and needles in your tail <laughs> okay so most people most people are okay with the idea but some saying no absolutely not imagine you could use it to entertain puppies children <laughs> cats. cats yes I'm going to Keep a cat entertained. They just try and catch your tail. Keep you entertained. You could run around in circles trying to catch your own tail. Mm -hmm. Could be a whole different branch of yoga involving a tail. <laughs> Get people who try to strengthen theirs. Go to the gym and <laughs> lift lift weights with their tails. <laughs> gone down a truly absurd route started with a mist and carried on from there I don't know I think a tail would be wonderful <laughs> alrighty I suppose we should probably carry on although I've really enjoyed sitting with the with these monkeys while we do while we proceed on our mission to find Tingana or if you pop across to Steve well welcome back everybody we've got some good news and we've also got some bad news we found a two male cheetah hooray the good news the bad news is they're in the valley behind us and we could not get any signal so although we were looking at them they were quite full, and I think they probably had eaten something. They got down into the bottom over there to have a drink. The one male had beautiful, very, very dark brown eyes, and the other male had lighter brown eyes, and definitely wasn't uh, Moogie with a funny nose. So I'm sorry, I, I'm probably going to guess it might be the Border Boys being two boys together. But unfortunately, everybody, sorry, but we can't put them on screen for you. But uh, this is the same area we had Olope the other day, and the same day place we had Mugi the other day and I had another male cheetah just around the corner I didn't get an ID on him yet and now two males now incredible potentially four different males maybe even five in the same area so it just goes to show how oh hello there's a little bit of a bit of shenanigans going on in the background there James can you see it <laughs> it is definitely the b buffalo breeding time Jamie was talking about babies and, well, that's how they start in Buffalo, everybody. <laughs> Although the one in the front is a male. So what you saw there was a bit of dominance happening. <laughs> you get dominance between males every now and again. I was watching a male yesterday morning. He was uh, busy trying to mate with a female. And his friend came up from the side and just rammed him off with his horns. It's not very nice, is it? So, anyway, we can't, unfortunately, show you those two male cheetah. Um, and it seemed like they were going to settle down. They were quite full. They drank for about four or five minutes, and then they lay down in a, in a slump in the long grass. So I do apologize about that. But uh, the burning of this big area has provided enormous feeding grounds for all of these Thompson's gazelle and the zebra as well, and a very nice herd of buffalo. We're going to go up to the buffalo and see if maybe there's any small babies there. Well, I did scan earlier and I saw two sort of tawny objects coming out of the forest behind us and coming down the hill. And I thought initially that they were lions, but we were quite far away. And then as we got closer, it was the two cheetah boys, which is very, very cool. There we go, four days in a row, five cheetah. 
at least we know where to come and look for them. Okay, well, I'm just going to try and get you all a better view of these buffalo. But while we do that, back down to South Africa with Lee, who has got a bird he would like to show you. So we have in camera, we had in camera. <laughs> How about that for timing? We had in camera a brown snake eagle, and it's gone. I was going to say, it's not often that you see a brown snake eagle sitting exposed like that on, on top of a dead tree. The uh, brief glimpse of him, I'm going to get a picture for you now. Um, unmistakable, the brown snake eagle. Here he is down here, number four. There are a lot of brown, plain brown eagles out here in, uh, in so South Africa, Southern Africa and East Africa. The brown snake eagle distribution wise uh, is a very widely distributed bird right throughout South Central, um, right up into North and uh, Central West Africa. But the brown snake eagle, that unmistakable upright posture, the crest on his head like that, and then, like all snake eagles, no feathers on his legs. And generally, they don't sit like we saw that one when they're hunting. They don't sit exposed. They actually sit on top of well-foliated trees, so trees with lots of leaves. And uh, in so doing, will obviously uh, not be easily seen by their preferred prey item. And we've sponsored a bottle of Dom Perignon. Actually, it's a... Your supply of Dom Perignon, if you can tell us what brown snake eagles love to eat. Brown snakes, of course. No, they are uh, snake eagles. They eat all sorts of snakes. Doesn't really matter about the color. And this time of year, once the uh, temperatures start dropping off and cooling down, the reptiles do become a little more scarce and uh, certainly the snakes and other reptiles that the brown snake eagle would target suddenly do become hard to find and they need to differentiate and start taking uh, more variety into their diet and they'll then uh, look at things like um, small, small rodents and maybe some insects, birds, things like that. So it's a really beautiful afternoon, really beautiful, another beautiful afternoon. Very seldom do we have it much different down in South Africa at this time of the year. The weather nice and mild. So from a bird in the tree to some birds on the ground, we've got a little covey of crested Franklin here. So the stripy backs of those Franklin helping them blend in to the stripes that are created by the grass. So from stripy Franklin over to Steve who's got some stripy zebra. Well, everybody, as promised, we've gotten a little bit closer to the buffalo herd, but we're just looking at all of these grazing animals out here. The zebras and the topies all enjoying where the fire has removed all of the dead grass and there's a very nice green flash that has come forward and you'll see them as james keeps panning left look at all of these animals lots of buffalo i don't think it's the same herd as yesterday it's m much smaller than yesterday's herd 
And there are a couple babies in there. I saw them before, but they've all just vanished. Amazing how quickly the herd can just sort of absorb a little young buffalo. And all the family groups of zebra littered around. Really, really beautiful out here. Ecological importance of fire. People believe it was used by hunter-gatherers to attract game, uh, to make hunting easier, to open up the landscape. And also, it does, as you can see, it definitely attracts game and it would make moving through these wilderness areas much easier. So if you had a, an area the size of the Masai Mara that was getting very long grass, there's history throughout Southern Africa or throughout Africa of human influence with regards to fires. And uh, so many of the strategies we impl implement, especially as far as I know down in South Africa, is to try and mimic lightning strikes, but also to take into consideration the human effect that was in play many, many years ago. Hunter-gatherers would burn to open the vegetation and also to attract wildlife into areas so that they could then obviously benefit off of their, their use. And uh, hunter-gatherers would have used everything from a buffalo, would have used all of their bones and, and uh, fur and all the skin and meat and everything possible so as to be able to uh, not waste anything. Very, very nice accumulation of herbivores here. Buffalo are looking at us wondering what are we doing here? There's one calf. Not a brand spanking new one. We saw some yesterday that were very, very wobbly on the feet. You can almost feel the flies around them, can't you? All the ears and tails flicking. The cat, there's a little one. Oh, hello, on the right. Look at that little one. She's tiny. Mum doesn't want to stop, it just wants to suckle. So tiny on his legs. We saw a number of those yesterday. Don't forget everybody, we'd love to answer any questions you might have. Send them through, hashtag Safari Live, or throw them in on the YouTube chat stream. <laughs> How cute is it seeing this little one? <laughs> it's just all legs. So yesterday, if you missed it, yesterday morning, I was with a quite a large herd of buffalo and all sorts of chaos was going on. And um, while we were watching them, it's possible that at least six youngsters were born. Minamu, you want to know why there's zebras? Well, there's always zebras in the Mara. They don't all leave. And um, also because this area has been burnt, it's attracted them. Um, we're not far from the Tanzania border. It's probably a probably about three miles or so behind me. It's not far at all. Not far at all. It's just that way. It's not really far. And the zebra, there's nothing stopping them from coming through. And fire is a form of attracting animals. And in these open areas, we are seeing the pre-migration most certainly. And everybody talks about the zebras normally being the first ones to arrive. Um, they facilitate by opening up the vegetation. They're able to chop the grass quite low uh, in areas that haven't been burnt. They'll actually feed on the tall oat grass, chopping it down where the wildebeest will actually benefit off of the short, shorter grass. Topies and the gazelle also like the shorter grass. Okay, well, all these zebras are looking at something off to the left there, James. Do you see? Ah, there's a jackal off to the left there. We'll find him for you. Blackback jackal. He's just disappeared behind the termite mound. Where's he gone? There we go. Got it. More, more left. A little bit more. Yes, there we go. Oh, I saw him. I'm getting confused now. There we go. He's just running past. Can you see that open area there? Oh, he's gone. Okay, so even small predators will attract the attention of uh, all of your herbivore animals. There we go. He's coming up onto that big mound. There we go. Well done, James. And a black-backed jackal. Um, territorial pairs. You do find them quite commonly out here. 
And they would probably follow those cheetah boys, try and pick up on whatever scraps they might have left behind. You see that little trotting that they do. I know everybody likes seeing Jackal, and <laughs> yesterday morning you might have seen that one that got a bit of a fright when it saw us. I love all the screenshots people posted. <laughs> Jackal had a little bit of a jump. You see, the zebras would have seen a predator and would have been like, well, what's that? And then, okay, we're not too bothered by you. So the zebras have the potential to chop that grass. You can see there's still some long grass here that hasn't been burnt. They're able to chop down the grass to a shorter level, and then that facilitates it growing back again. And uh, then that helps the wildebeest, as well as the topi, as well as the gazelle. But now the zebra are enjoying the very nice regrowth after the fire. It's important, though, when trying to mimic these sort of old-style fires, to, to make them as large as possible. You can't just go and make very small little squares because you're suddenly going to have every single animal from every corner of the, of the area coming in onto the small block. So the larger it is, the less sort of pressure you put on that area. So this whole area here is going to regrow. It's going to provide food for all the animals. But if the block is very small, it's going to actually get overgrazed very, very quickly. So this block is pretty big. Um, the block towards our camp as well, all the way along the escarpment, is also a very, very big block. For example, in the Kruger Park, they normally burn blocks between 10 and 15,000 hectares. So that's not a very small area at all. That's bigger than some reserves. Okay, so some reserves are only a few hundred hectares, a thousand, two thousand hectares, some very small game farms. So it's very difficult to, to manage. You have to have more intense management. The smaller your property is, the larger your property is, the less intensive management. Hello, Paula. Um, a buffalo full grown. Um, I'm not actually sure. I mean, they, they, they weaned probably after about six months or so, maybe a year. But uh, they just integrate into the herd. You'll see all these different sort of age groups within the buffalo herd. But at what stage are they fully grown? I'm not really sure. Um, I think bulls, you, you could start rating bulls as being mature about the, around the age of seven, eight. Um, but females probably start breeding a little bit earlier than that. But males probably wouldn't be allowed to breed earlier than that. But I'll, I'll have a look, see if I can find exactly what is when they are mature. Because um, buffalo, Cape buffalo, also known as the African buffalo, very, very interesting animals. So, yeah, the females can carve first at about five. Um, and the males, it's three to four years earlier than males. So, so males only about the age of eight or nine. So that's when they start getting mature. And the interval between births can be as much as 15 months. in good conditions, so up here in the Mara, probably a lot more regular than down in South Africa where we get quite a lot of drought. There it can be pushed to two years. Um, but I don't know, parent offspring. So females five, males sort of start, they, they're in the herd the whole time, um, but they kind of just sort of hang around. There's no real breeding with the males until they sort of form their, their dominant groups with a lot of the other males. And after the age of sort of 10, 11, that's when buffalo bulls become dugger boys. They get so tired of all the argy-bargy and pushing and shoving that happens with inside the herd that they just move off and go and hang out on their own, which is when we get the dugger boys, which is very cool. Okay, well, that's it for buffalo for the moment. I'm live, gentlemen. Can you just give me a minute? Thank you. Okay, and we're going to move off. Kiara, it's about nine, nine and a half months for buffalo, which is quite interesting. It's the same as us. And um, But the buffalo, you see them coming out, and they land on the ground. There we go. And they're able to walk within 15 minutes. Um, they need to be able to get up and follow the herd because if they don't follow the herd, well, they get left behind and then obviously uh, predators, even a jackal, would take a baby buffalo if it's left alone. So it's imperative with these open plains animals, wildebeest, topi, as well as um, buffalo, that when they drop their calves, that they're able to move quickly. 
Because if they're not, and they get picked off very, very, very soon. We know how selective and opportunistic our predators can be. And Gigi on the weekend actually found one of the Chelly boys with a buffalo calf, uh, which is probably very, very new. So if a lion pride came up to this herd, they would always select the easiest target. That's why I commented how quickly the youngsters can be swallowed inside that herd, making them a very much un, very much harder target to find. Okay, well, down in South Africa, Jamie is searching for her own big five this afternoon. Let's go see if she's having any luck. Okay, so it's a shame about Steve's cheetah, of course, but such is the way of things. We actually have no updates for you. I cannot tell you anything interesting that's happened except for an extended discussion about, you know, what type of tail one would have. But apart from that, we have found nothing at all. I, try, I did actually find a male in Yala, but he walked away. Oh, and the, the water buck that has become my, my um, I think, quite a suitable representation of this drive. Because as soon as he saw me, he ran away again. Mm -hmm. Starting to wonder if this is just the effect I have. Anyway, we're going to go along Vulture's Nest and we're going to go look for Tlalamba. And Herbie this morning, I chatted to him briefly. He was convinced that Tlalamba was somewhere around here. So we're going to drive along that way. We're going to go and have a look and see what we can see. As it gets a little bit darker and then we'll go to the hyena den afterwards. I haven't seen them yet. Apparently they were around this morning. So I'm quite relieved about that because I was starting to worry that, that, that they'd left that den. But it doesn't look like that's the case. This leopard is in here somewhere. I'm convinced. I just wish that this morning we'd seen those tracks better. Because I don't know where he went from here. Tags, tags. Tags, you didn't pick up on any tracks around this area, did you? Okay, copy, thanks. Yeah, it's been up and down a lot. I'm just going to check Vulture's Nest and then loop back around that side. Thank you. Cool. So, Tax picked up on tracks further on this side, on Yala Road South, which is actually, that also is very helpful because that means we've been looking in slightly the wrong place. So, tracks up and down here. Oh, I wonder. Oh, hold on. Tax, sorry, just confirm female tracks. Okay, copy, awesome, thank you. Yeah, female. So that's the female that walked up the Mulwati and then towards this area. Now that could easily be Tundi. So she's denned off that particular road. Now, I, as I mentioned earlier, we're not gonna force the issue with Tundi's den, but we are going to try and figure out roughly where it is, largely so that we can avoid it on walks just squashed wildebeest dung so that we can avoid it when we're walking so that we if necessary can close the area whatever the case may be ideally we'd like to know where the den is and we can at this stage you know you can view leopard cubs at this age with the mother present if she if she's comfortable with it but it's something that has to be done with extreme caution and under unique well, relatively cautious circumstances essentially so that's it is something that we approach with the highest standard of ethics that we can possibly provide but we do need to know where she is so we are looking now let's go back and around and through to Batalier, i think and loop around that way
Paula? No. Nobody has seen the cubs yet. Uh, they have not, they haven't popped out at all. There's no sign of them. We, we actually, um, truth be told, we, we're not 100% certain that there are cubs. We're relatively sure, but we're not 100% certain. And the only way that we'll confirm that is when we see her belly properly and we see suckle marks. I'm not sure, I know Ben was the last person to see her. I don't think, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think he saw suckle marks on her. I know she was looking hungry and her belly was looking a lot smaller. Look, there was such a dramatic drop in the size of her belly that I'm certain that she, I'm pretty certain that she gave birth. You're picking leaves there, Seb. Yep. Did you get enough for everyone or just, what tree is that? <laughs> Russet bush willow. <Good. laughs> Thank First you. Thank you, I passed my test, woo. There you go, you can have your leaf back. Oh, that is very happy news. Steve, well done. I'm very impressed. He's managed to find you a cheetah, off you go. Well, everybody, good news once again. We decided to come back to see if maybe the cheetah have come out of the drainage. And they have, but we are parked far away so that we can maintain signal with um, the masks, masts that are on the mountain towards the north. And here we have them. So, there's two males. They seem like they've eaten. And when we saw them walking earlier, they definitely had very full bellies. But I wonder if any of you out there from just these images is able to identify them for me. That would be marvelous if you could. I wasn't able to get any, any close-up shots before they were in the drainage, hidden by some grass. Now they're out in the open, but a little bit too far for my camera. But definitely much more successful as a pair. They can also look in two different directions at the same time, which can keep, keep the sort of wits about them for the approach of any lions, which are their biggest threat. It's very likely that that jackal was on its way to maybe a cheetah kill that was somewhere there and um, the cheetah would have left whatever was left and moved off to go and have a drink and they never return to kills because generally they're not powerful enough to maintain or to hold on to the kill. So once cheetahs leave a carcass, generally for the most part that's it, they don't go back. Even I've even known vultures to come in and start landing and cause cheetahs to leave because lions and hyenas will often follow vultures and um, I've seen them looking at the sky and then cheetahs leave, leave and move off. Patty, I'm glad we were able to find them for you. It's just so frustrating if you can come out in the search of an animal, you find them and you can get nice and close because we can off-road, um, but then <laughs> you can't broadcast to anybody. So... That would have been very a very big shame if we weren't able to show you these two beautiful boys today. And maybe, maybe they're still hungry. Who knows? The plains, as you saw before, are littered with general game. And when you are a coalition of cheetah, you can take bigger animals. They could even take a topi. They could make... Ow! They are biting flies here that are very annoying. <laughs> Ow! I'm going to catch you, little fly. You just bit me on the leg. Sorry if I jumped there, James. <laughs> so now I know what it feels like to be a buffalo. <laughs> Ouch, all these biting flies. There are quite a lot of them. They love to suck the blood. Mary, the five cheetah boys, as far as I'm aware, are still on the other side of the river. Um, I've never seen them before. Um, we don't really get over to that side. But as far as I'm aware, they're still doing their thing. They're still going strong. Uh, Mugi, the male cheetah I had two days ago, he apparently, according to Manu, um, the cam up, he tried to join them at one point. But, you know, five is, is a good number. Six, six is just too many, isn't it? <laughs> but I think Mugi as well as a Lope, the male we saw the other day, would do very well to try and join up with these two. The cheetah males sometimes can be completely uh, from separate families, can join up. 
or if they're brothers from the same litter, very, very useful in joining or staying together. You never see females hanging out in groups unless it's mum with a couple of her youngsters. And as soon as she breeds again, then those youngsters get sort of sent packing. So it does benefit male cheetahs to hang out in groups. And um, these are definitely two males, but at the moment, I'm sorry, I haven't been able to identify them. So if any of you out there are able to, with the limited amount of visibility we're giving you here, then well done. James, of course. Well, we'll get them to stand up shortly. Um, we're going to stay here. We're not going to go anywhere because there's a good chance they might move again. Um, but they might be too full. They might do absolutely nothing. Who knows? And we'll be sure to make sure we get some side-on views of them. I can tell you one thing for sure, though, James, is they don't have any funny little bump on the nose. That's the first thing I looked for. But one of them had very dark brown eyes and the other one had very light eyes. If that helps anybody at all, let me know. Um, <laughs> I'm going to see if I can find anything, but um, seeing as we're in an area where we don't really get a signal for the vehicle, we don't get Wi-Fi out here either. So even checking on those ID kits or going onto the new cheetah group on Facebook makes it very, very tricky. Well, I was talking about cheetahs and vultures moving in to take their kills. Lions and all sorts like to move in as well. Ali has found the feathered bird itself. So while Steve is IDing the cheetahs up in the morrow, we've got a white-backed vulture for you down here in Juma. Not a great view of him, he's silhouetted against the uh, setting sun, but that unmistakable appearance of an undertaker. The big great coat over his hunched back stooping head forward no wonder they uh, are not the most popular and photogenic birds on the planet not a lot of people have pictures of vultures above their fireplaces i don't think but of course they are the unsung heroes and the uh, thankless task of being a garbage man whether you're in new york city or the african savannah it's not a nice job by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a vital job. If garbage men had to stop taking garbage in New York, the city would grind to a halt in a matter of days. It would take a bit longer here if the vultures went on strike, but um, the reality of cleaning up the dead uh, carcasses out here, if the vultures didn't do it, there'd be a smell that we wouldn't be able to tolerate flies and uh, the spread of disease would would expand so not ideal by any stretch of the imagination vultures are amazing uh they're common coming in there the uh the uh interesting facts about vultures they are uh, have been recorded well it's acknowledged that the world's highest flying bird 32,000 feet a rupel's griffin vulture uh, above the coast of west africa flew into the engine of a jet the jet landed safely it was no damage to the plane but um at 32,000 feet don't quote me but there's not a lot of oxygen there and quite how a vulture um can not only survive up there, but fly, expend energy up there is, is, is quite amazing. Up in the jet streams, quite incredible. It was fun stopping to look at birds because uh, on the other side of our car, we've just walked into view now with the, sen the sun behind them, are some kudu. They're going to be coming into the gap there, but more to the left. Uh, the other members of the group, there was one lovely big bull who's hiding now. But this beautiful afternoon light, those uh, lovely golden brown leaves of the trees behind them, and those massive ears. Unmistakable silhouette of the, uh, of the kudu. 
Proportionately, I can't think of any other antelope with ears that big, and it's a perfect adaptation out here. Their habitat preference of the thicker bush means that they rely, they rely on their hearing to stay out of the way of predators. And speaking of predators, we're going to head uh, back up to the Masai Mara. Steve has some more news on those cheetah for us. Well, indeed, the kudu has got some phenomenal ears, and ideally they don't want to be seen by a cheetah. And James was it who had uh, the cheetah in Juma killing that kudu later last year. Well, everybody, you can probably notice we've got a little bit closer here, and, uh, well, luck is on our side because somehow we seem to have signal. When we were here earlier, there was no signal, so maybe it's just the way that the vehicle is now positioned. So there we go. You can see the belly is rather, rather rotund. That's the one, I think, with the very dark eyes. Beautiful indeed. So now, everybody, you must have a closer view of him or them. You'll probably be able to identify them now. I'm going to guess, because of where we are, but the <laughs> guessing is never ideal, is it, that they're the border boys. Do you agree, James? Yes. James seems to think so. But I'm still trying to figure out... Enjoying Hong Kong, I'm really not sure. I, I'm really no expert when it comes to aging a cheetah. Um, they don't look too old, but, you know, five years, four years would be a guess, but I really don't know. Um, the only way, you know, cheetahs are very difficult from an, an age point of view. Um, they don't live very long, so you can assume that they don't live much more than six, seven years of age because of the competition that they undertake, undergo out here. But I'm sure once we get an ID of them, there will also be a birthday as well. So let's see, four or five years, somewhere around there. But I really don't know joy in Hong Kong. Identifying age in cheetahs is tricky, for me anyway. Maybe someone else has got a little technique or trick for me. I've seen more cheetah now in the last four days than I have in my life. So it's very, very, very cool indeed. And look how close we've gotten to from hundreds of meters away with the zoom of the camera. We're now here, so I think this is a good spot. We've got a good signal. Okay, so Jamie says one of the border boys is dead. So this is another two boys. Who knows who they are? One of them is dead of the border boys, and they are quite old. And, um, well, definitely a male. I can see that little jewels under his tail. I mean, this open system has the potential to have anything coming through. So there could be cheetah coalitions coming in from Tanzania and moving out again, just like we saw the other day, having two different male cheetah in the same area in two consecutive days. And now we've got two more in a very similar area. Exactly where we are now is kind of where I left Mugi two nights ago. And he, we found him on the opposite side of the valley there. And that is where we left um, Alope the, that, m the morning before. So it's very hard to, to say exactly who. And uh, without the technology, without all of the photographs and ID kits, uh, it would be impossible to know who. So hopefully someone will be able to help me. Lindsay, I really don't know. I mean, male cheetah, when they're young, either will leave a family group um, as two brothers and then their coalition. Uh, they might be one single male he might accept for the first couple of years. I really don't know if there's a sort of a cutoff line. Also, when there's five male cheetah, they've, 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 they've got their hierarchy, their dominance, their sort of, sort of all sorts of things going on. In oh, Where are they going? Where are you going, boys? Going to pose for us nicely. So when there's five, I think that's more than enough. Um, but when do cheetahs stop accepting? I really don't know. I don't think there's an actual answer to that. Every situation is going to be different. It's the same as male coalition. Seeing Kapuli last year, accepting the two sausage tree pride males sort of as a group with him and then allowing them to mate in front of him is something I've never heard of. So who knows? There we go. They're going to walk to the next termite mound and give us a very nice view of themselves. Aren't they beautiful? So we'd hope they were going to move. I don't think they're going to hunt, though. But why move? 
better view from there, of course. <laughs> beautiful scenes very privileged to be able to spend time out here with cheetah oh, look at them see how they will look in opposite directions it is always a problem of a lion trying to sneak up with them they're always looking over their shoulder okay well, thank you, James Richard. I'm going to make a note of that. James Richard has called them the Lamai boys. James, have you seen them before? James hasn't seen them before. Lamai. Okay, so I've got some research to do when I get home. Lamai boys. I wonder exactly where they come from. I wonder, James, if you've even got an age for us there as well. So coalition of male cheetah it's nice to see them around um that is now definitely two different boys now i've officially seen four cheetah don't know who it was i saw yesterday around the corner i'll have to get some photo id it wasn't the best of visuals but four cheetah five maybe five different cheetah in three days four days that is the maasai mara for you people and uh it is the burnt area that is providing it for them. The burnt area is providing the openness. It is bringing the food for them. This is exactly where the cheetah want to hang out. Paul, I think there's bones in every tail. I don't know how many, but I mean, you've seen Kinky Tail's tail. Her tail is broken from something. I don't know what happened, but that's basically just a bone in there that's broken. So they are, the flies are unbelievable. There, there are bones and tails. Um, Jamie wants more bones in her body. She wants a tail. A tail would be quite a funny thing. James, you think you could have a tail? James doesn't want a tail. <laughs> I, I would have a tail. I am a monkey by the year of my birth. So I should actually have a tail. Year of the monkey. So I probably do have a tail. You just can't see it. Okay, so I don't want to move uh, while we're live because we might lose signal. But we will reposition again uh, when you leave us and see if we can get into another view of these two boys. Because it was surprising. Because the other day um, when Moogie went down to drink, was down to the right there at the bottom where these males are and we had signal down there so maybe we were just in a very black spot a little while ago anyway before we reposition let's send you back on down to Juma with Jamie who still wants a tail well I have to say that I struggle to picture Steve with a tail and I'm struggling even more so to picture big james with a tail it is actually almost impossible to do so i understand okay fair enough i don't know i think people are completely missing out on the whimsical nature of this conversation how could you not want a tail it's got so many more advantages than it does disadvantages and if everyone had one it would be fine and if only you had one then it would also be fine because you could do all sorts of things you know could do whatever you wanted. You'd be famous. I suppose some people don't want to be famous for having a tail. That's fair enough. Actually, I wouldn't really want to be famous for having a tail. Anyway, I, I don't have much more to add about the tail discussion. That's not a leopard, is it? Probably not. Might be a log. Oops. Log. Log? Log. Definitely log. Leopard log. I'm really good at spotting those. I'm great at spotting leopard logs. I've now checked one side of Tundi's old den. I'm going round to the other side of Tundi's old den. The problem is, is that I wasn't here when Tundi denned Tlalamba. I only arrived when Tlalamba was... How old was she? Eight months or so? Which means that... No, she was about ten months old, actually. Which means... I'm going back on memory from where Hosanna and 
Shungile were in their den site. And I can't actually remember exactly which log it was under. I must, I must double check. I'll call Tristan tonight and I'll just check with him and I'll see. Because often female leopards will reuse the same den sites. And it makes sense because they're comfortable with the way in, the way out, the escape routes, the safe places for the cubs. They know that it's worked in the past. So it makes sense for them to be habitual about where they put their, whoops, tree, cubs. So taxator tracks were up and down here, Nyala Road South. It could of course be Tlalamba. At this point, it's getting very difficult to tell. I think the old entrance was down here. It wasn't very easy to get into. Remember, you can keep sending through your questions. You can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. That's how you can get hold of us. We do love to hear from you. Oh, where's the gear stick? Here it is. No, don't run away. It's a small things kind of a drive. Birds, little things. You never know, we might just see a leopard while we stop for squirrels. who are also doing something similar to the monkeys. They're munching away on whatever they can find. There's still a lot of seeds about and fruits as well. Nibble, 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 nibble. That could easily be a bush willow seed or perhaps a grass seed. And they've each got one. And they're both storing up as much energy as possible. While they munch away, uh, it sounds as though Steve's a cheetah are now up. And of course, as you know, they can move quite quickly. So before they disappear, if you go across to him. Well, thanks, Jamie. If anything's got a fluffier tail than a squirrel, I'd love somebody to tell me. Jamie probably would love a squirrel's tail. But then here we've got the cheetah with their very rudder-like tail which aims or enables them to help steer when they turn corners at high speed. When Thompson's gazelle turn them left or right, they're able to sort of counterweight and balance themselves as they take those big corners. Uh, leopards use their tails for balance. No doubt monkeys do as well. And squirrels, well, they just pop them up and down whenever they're getting alarmed. Very, very funny animal squirrels. So we're not going to follow these cheetah for a little bit. We're going to stay here up on the slope and see where they go to. They might cross the drainage line over there and then get onto the other side. He, see, he's not looking as full. The other one was looking a bit fuller, I thought. The other one is on top of the term mound, looking very regal. Some guinea fowl. <laughs> Got a bit frightened earlier when we first found the cheetah. They thought, oh no, <laughs> the end of the world has arrived. What have you spotted down there, guys? See, he looks like he's got a bit of a belly on him. I wouldn't think that one would have eaten and the other one hadn't. Spat, you want to know the kill rate of a cheetah? Obviously, I think I don't think there's a, a general sort of over... A number. I mean, lions and leopards, everybody says it around 20%, and cheetah is a lot more successful. I don't only really have a number for you, but I mean, some cheetah have got 100% success on foals and lambs. They're very good at that. And then it's probably in the 30s, maybe 40% success rate, uh, somewhere around there. But also depends if there's a coalition. For example, these guys are probably twice as successful than a single cheetah. And the coalition of five, the musketeers, are probably five times as successful as a single cheetah. So you can't really just, there can't be like a blanket rule. And obviously experience has a lot to play. Um, a very experienced cheetah mum is obviously going to be a lot more uh, effective at catching prey than her cubs. But um, as they get older and more experienced, like Tundi is a very, very good hunter, very good huntress, probably the most successful Huntress I've come across, but um, all depends on the time of the year, 
on the food availability as well and on the breeding because obviously when there's lots of babies around predators have a much higher success rate well lee seems to be enjoying a nice birding drive this afternoon let's go see what raptor he's got for you this time So cheetahs have a high success rate, but so do the birds of prey down here. And we can't identify this particular individual because the sun, the bright orange ball, is uh, making it impossible for me to look through my binoculars. If um, you do look at the sun with binoculars, you are not going to be a happy chappy by any stretch of the imagination. I don't know if there will be permanent damage, but it's certainly will temporarily blind you. And the sun is just out of the top left-hand corner of the screen, and that's actually too close. The filters on the camera allow us to uh, point the camera down there. What a beautiful scene. It's probably about uh, 20 minutes before the sun drops below the western horizon here. And I'm going to hazard a guess that... That is a Batalure eagle, just by the shape of it. But if anybody else has any ideas on the ID, the species of this raptor, hashtag Safari Live or use the chat on the YouTube link and uh, let us know what you think it is. Although I'm doubting myself now, there's a bit of a crest there behind the head and I don't think that that is a wing tip below it usually a battler's wing tips come past their very short tail I think that's part of the uh, branch the piece sticking out which could be a wing tip but I think it's part of a branch little drongo just flew over its head there. The drongo is uh, certainly one of the braver birds around. They give all the raptors a really hard time. What we're going to do is just edge a little bit forward. We'll be able to um, hopefully ID it for you if we go front forwards down the hill. Joy in Hong Kong can make out the red on the wing. Well, well done, Joy. We are about to reveal the species. We're going forward now, and um, we'll be able to get the sun behind us. And we will tell you what it is. My background in the bush is um, a, a private safari guide. I guide uh, safaris right throughout southern and east Africa and Madagascar. I'm going to interrupt you there for a second to congratulate Joy from Hong Kong, who, juvenile battler, she was bang on the money. Well done, Joy. So yeah, 19 years odd in the bush. Uh, I began my career with a company called Singita, just south of where we are actually in, in Juma and uh, worked in the Sabi Sands and then at a concession called Lubombo inside the Kruger National Park. And then for five years, I worked for them up in the greater Serengeti Mastai Mara ecosystem. So just south of where Steve is now inside Tanzania and left them about uh, nine years ago, and since then have been private guiding. I've been going to Madagascar a lot, and I do right throughout southern and east Africa. Privately guided safaris. So yeah, a juvenile battalier eagle, they're often one of the last birds to get going in the morning, the uh, bigger birds of prey, like the battalier, unlike the 
smaller passerines and uh, uh, perching birds that get going from very early, they will wait usually for the day to warm up a bit. Uh, and then as the day cools down, they will often be the first to come to bed. A juvenile battalier, this plain brown eagle, uh, will grow into one of the most magnificent adult raptors, red and gray and black, absolutely beautiful, but it takes a battalier about seven years to attain that adult plumage, which would lend us to believe that uh, it's quite a long-lived bird. Birds, of course, are exceptionally long-lived, you know, parrots, domestic parrots, the uh, the African grey parrots that are indigenous to Central Africa that people keep as pets right throughout the world outlive their owners with a fair amount of regularity. There goes our juvenile battalier. Probably going to go and find a tree to roost in for the night. Cool. Let's head on and go and see what else we can find. We're heading straight west into the setting sun. And it's usually about now that uh, we can start to expect a little bit of movement from our spotty cats. We were looking for them this morning and we've been looking for them this afternoon with no joy. Usually they're more crepuscular or da or nocturnal activities will have them starting to get going about now. It's got a lot cooler and uh, they will also use the cover of darkness to their advantage. Fantastic night vision. And what we tend to do this time of day on safari is have a gin and tonic. But we're not going to do that this afternoon. We're going to keep moving. We will stop and listen quite often when we are drinking gin and tonics to celebrate the sunset. We do hear alarm calls or the vocalizations and territorial calls of the predators. We're on a road now called Mamba Road. And I think every concession has a road called Mamba Road. It's usually because a black mamba was seen on it and uh, be keeping a lookout for the black mamba of Mamba Road. So Steve is uh, still with the cheetah back in the Maasai Mara. Over to you, Steve. Cheetah are moving from one termite mound to another and they're much further down now in the valley so we're still a little bit far from them we're just trying to maintain our signal the one cheetah you saw before is, does not look full at all and this guy does look rather full so quite a strange sort of thought you know two cheetahs maybe made a kill and one ate the other one didn't well, it doesn't make any sense maybe one hunted and the other one was busy busy napping very hard to say. We didn't see it. But that guy there definitely has eaten a lot. Whereas his brother has not. Seemingly. Maybe he just doesn't show his weight as much. Empty legs. Well, they've been very interested in, in this drainage line off to the right-hand side. I don't know if maybe there's some sort of skulking animal that's disappeared in there a few times, but they keep looking in. I wonder if something's going to pop out, maybe a reed buck or an oroby or something might be hiding in there that the cheetah might actually try and catch. Well, they had their attention fixed on the area. So who knows what could happen. Beautiful light now. 
this golden afternoon light and this cheetah's posing for us beautifully. They're quite relaxed. They walked right past the car before. I think the cheetah out in the Mara system do get to see a number of vehicles. Okay, everybody, well, we're going to be going on to a school drive in a moment, so we'll be signing out of this and into that, and we'll catch up with you shortly.